Hello, this is Tommy Franks. Welcome to the Four Star Leadership Podcast, a product of the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum. We're here to get a view into the lives of the legacy makers, the movers and the shakers of today, to offer insights from the full spectrum of the leadership community. We'll talk to former Four Star students and explore their leadership development path. We'll work to find out what they are about today and learn from the opportunities they've made for themselves in this world. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this podcast. Remember, leaders are not born, they're developed. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Core Principles of Leadership with General Tommy Franks. I'm your host, Elise Travis. We're on episode number 28 with our guest, Jamie Slythe. We'll be talking about what he learned about leadership in his 23 years as a Special Operations Marine and how perspective is a game changer in life. But before we get into our program, we'll have a word from our major sponsor, REI Oklahoma. REI Oklahoma is proud to be a part of the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute in the production and distribution of these podcasts designed to inspire leaders and difference makers. At REI Oklahoma, we have been working with small business leaders, entrepreneurs, and people who are driven to succeed for years. Highly motivated people working to own their own businesses, live in their own homes, and make the world a better place. Since its beginning, REI Oklahoma has continued to identify hurdles and deliver holistic solutions to create job growth and help neighborhoods thrive in both rural and urban communities. REI Oklahoma looks forward to visiting with you about helping your business and community grow. Visit reiok.org or call 800-658-2823 to start the conversation. The Labar family is a fourth-generation Oklahoma family. That may not sound like a long time, but our grandfathers were born here, within the Comanche Nation, before the land runs. We are the proudest sponsor of the Tommy Franks Four Star Leadership Podcast. We hope listeners will heed the words of these distinguished men and women who have served our country at the highest levels and across all walks of life. James Slyke, better known as Jamie, has been a husband for 29 years to his beautiful wife, Angie, and a proud father to his two boys, Colton and Caleb. Jamie is a graduate of the University of Charleston, West Virginia, where he earned his Bachelor of Science in Organizational Leadership. He is also a retired Marine of 23 years. While in the Marine Corps, Jamie served 22 years of his 23 years in special operations and graduated from the most challenging schools the military has to offer, including military skydiving, military scuba diver, reconnaissance school, army ranger school, and marine scout sniper. He has served on teams from two-man sniper teams to 40-man combat assault teams. During his career, Jamie has been assessed and selected for three separate Special Operation Commands, Marine Corps Special Operations Command Detachment 1, Joint Special Operations Command, and Marine Special Operations Command. Jamie has deployed in combat operations five separate times and is the recipient of the Bronze Star Medal. Jamie retired from the Marine Corps in January of 2017. He now serves as a leadership instructor for a company called The Program, LLC, where he works with 160 separate colleges and corporate teams on team building and leadership development. Please welcome Jamie Slythe. Good morning, Jamie. Um, we're talking with Jamie Slide, a 23-year Marine Corps veteran in special operations. Good morning, Jamie. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. And welcome. Yeah, th- and thank, thank you, you so much for taking some time to visit with us on our podcast. Um, I want to start. We usually ask so we can kind of get to know our people that we're visiting with. Can you share with us? your hometown, and where you're from originally, what your family was like, parents, siblings, your high, you know, your childhood, and, and just kind of tell us how you started out life. Yeah. Uh, I, a lot of times when I do this, people will sit around and they'll 
sudden they'll gather around because I start talking about some crazy things. Cause I grew up in, uh, I, I was born in a small town called Piqua. Uh, no one ever really knows about it, but it actually is <laughs> the history of it is it's actually the first nuclear city, which is pretty interesting. I didn't know that until I was walking on the, the bike trail and saw it, but Piqua, P I Q U A, uh, was grew up there, was born there, uh, to my mother and father, uh, Jim and Connie Slife. And then, uh, I was, I was the third. So it was named James Robert Slife the third. Uh, there's no fourth. So before you ever asked, there's no fourth. I didn't have the fourth. I, I named uh, my other kid, my kids, some, something else, but, um, yeah, I was born in that little small town. And then my mom always had a, um, I grew up in, in town, but it was uh, a small little property, uh, you know, three, but we had three acres with woods and Creek inside of town. My mom always loved the country. So we eventually moved out to the country. So I grew up and I was born in Pickwa, Ohio, but I graduated from outside uh, that actual city uh, from a, uh, a school called Miami East. I have one sister. My parents are still married. Uh, they're at, they'll be 50 years this year. So it's pretty exciting for us. I grew up when we moved out to the country, moved out to a small little country home that had 10 acres. I had a woods and a creek. My whole life has always had woods and a creek and I had, um, we had farm animals. I grew up, my mom, my mom loves, uh, loves animals. Uh, my dad eventually grew to love like farm animals. So we had every kind of animal you could think of. I had pet raccoon. Uh, at one point my mom and dad even owned a bear. So, uh, pretty interesting story, but, um, yeah, I grew up with goats and ostriches and all that stuff on our little, local farm that we had there. And, uh, I was the, uh, I was the gas to fire when you talk about kids in high kids in high school. So I was, uh, if I got around, they say, you know, one boy, bad decision, two boys, no decisions. Uh, when boys get, you know, teenage boys get together. And I was the guy that when you come in, you be three kids and they're around and there's no good ideas getting put out there. I would just be the gas to that fire. So yeah, that's, that's a dumb decision. Let, let's go make this even dumber. So I was that, that kid, uh, my whole life, I try to figure out how my parents, uh, yeah, put up with me, uh, cause I got myself into a lot of trouble, but grew up there, had one sister, wonderful sister, still cl- very close to her. She was, uh, one year younger than me, uh, which, you know, had its perks too. Cause I was, a, uh, you know, I became friends with all of her friends and she, so it was, uh, that was a, a, a great life. She and I were always close. I was the big brother that stuck up for her. And, um, yeah, I ended up graduating and went to Miami East high school, uh, I graduated from my niece, but I attended a, my junior and senior year, I, I attended a school called Montgomery County Joint uh, Career Center, Career Technical Center. I went there for law enforcement, but you know, because of my troubles and stuff, I <laughs> ended up getting kicked out of school my last year of high school. So we'll talk about that, I'm sure. So I think that, uh, pretty much covers it, but my parents, yeah, I had great parents, my mom and dad, um, my dad you know, loves me more than, you know, a lot of, a lot of, I'm very fortunate. Um, my, my dad always told me not to up when I say things. So I always apologize for that. Um, yeah, just cause I have such a great regard for my father. I had a great father always told me how much he loved me and always told me how proud he was of me. Um, still to this day, you know, my mom, you know, she's the, <laughs> she's the salt of my life. Uh, she's never let me down. Not one time. I mean, today I could literally say, can you come out here? She's, she's had foot surgery. She would be out here to to, to help out, pick up whatever she needs to do to help out. And she's always been there for my life. So, uh, that's pretty much where I was as a kid. I mean, as we go into this, I'm sure that more of that will come in. Cause I, I think part of my life and where I ended up, um, turning into and how I grew is through my experiences as a kid, you know, from the troubles to the, to the animals, to, everything that I, the woods and the Creek, you know, was my, you know, the creeks were my, my roads to get to where I needed to get to. And yeah. So uh, a lot of good, good memories there. That's a great story. And, and I, I'm looking forward to hearing, cause I know it probably wasn't very humorous then, but it might be humorous now 
because you you did obviously turn it around. So um, you were in high school. You wanted to go to um, to the police academy, I guess. Is that was that yeah the plan? yeah. So the plan was. Yeah, the plan was I wanted to, I always wanted to be in the military. Um, in the sixth grade, they had career day and I came in, you wouldn't be allowed to do this nowadays, but uh, I came in a pair of camouflage fatigues I had on, I had a little fake Uzi and for my, my sixth, sixth grade, you know, a little gun and mm-hmm. I, I stood there for my picture. I still have that picture to this day. Um, me for career day, I wanted to go in the military and I came in on that. So it was always my thought process when I was in high school, though. Um, you know, law enforcement was, the, you know, always thought of, too. So after the military, I would go into law enforcement. So I went to uh, at the Career Technical Center. I went to the law enforcement, um, a two year law enforcement uh, deal there at that Career Technical Center. So it was the way that we have up here is we have these career technical signals that you can attend in junior year. And so they get you into a career. My, my son now he's 17. He goes to heavy equipment. They have AC. It's the trades kind of. Right. Right. And we, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with that as well. So did you want to go into law enforcement? I'm just curious because you had a lot of experience with the law enforcement as you grew up or was no. that kind of trouble? I don't just, honestly. yeah, well, so, so no, no. So I had, a yeah, the, the troubles that I had ended up being with the law that I, I was a, when I say honoring, when I was gas to fire, when I tell you that I was gas to fire. So I was a, um, I was one of those kids that my dad taught me, like, you know, there isn't such a thing as a bully, right? Because the first thing, the first thing you do to a bully is you, you, you take care of a bully, right? It's on every TV show. Like if a bully gets punched or gets pushed back, he doesn't a bully anymore. So I was kind of taught very early that um, bullies, um, you know, there isn't such a thing as a bully. So I was very quick tempered. Um, I was a, always a very good personality kid, but I was very quick to temper. I never really avoided conflict. I actually would seek it out. So when I tell you that gas the fire, like I would, I did a lot of fighting as a young, young man. Uh, the irony is it's, I teach conflict resolution now. So it's kind of the irony of my life, but um, it wasn't much when I was a kid, I would just get upset uh, with people. And so the way that I would deal with that is if, if somebody, you know, bullies uh, or anybody was picking on somebody else, I would automatically stand up for them. But there was also times that I would be out with a group of guys and we would just go out and, and, and mess with people as well that was part of my trouble with the law part of it and then um i picked groups of kids i didn't realize this as a child when i was growing up is i know this this is a leadership podcast so when i talk about this i believe leadership is influence right and then when i when i finally did go to college it's uncoerced influence, right? You're able to get people. I didn't realize this when I was growing up, but I had now as I evaluate my life, when I was growing up, I had pods of friends. So I had a pod here that liked to fight and and they were more of the 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 higher social class guys, but we like to kind of fight and you know party and drink and do silly stuff as teen- teenagers do. Then I had a group over here that was fun. They, they stayed out of trouble, but they were just fun laughter. And then I had this group over here that liked to do even more stuff. They were into the, the higher adrenaline type dumb stuff. And none of these groups knew of each other, but I was the, the person that would bounce around to all these groups and be in them. And, um, and as a kid, I didn't even realize that, that I had that, but it's kind of what it was. So whatever my mood was, so if I wanted to go and get, you know, trouble with fighting and that stuff, I would run with this group. If I wanted, after I would hang out with these guys, my adrenaline was high, I wanted to go do this, I would go do this with this group of people. I was never into any uh, any in, in, any drugs even as a kid. Uh, really, drinking was about the only thing that I did. And then, um, but I had this large group of friends that no one ever knew until we were adults, like 
they had this whole, and I never even realized I was that way. So as a kid, I had this influence that I didn't even realize I had to, to be able to move back and forth and to, to penetrate all these groups and no one even knew it. And then I realized that my retirement, when I, when I retired from the military, I had the same thing, like similar people, because all of my friends were like, I didn't know you, I didn't know that. Wow. <laughs> I feel bamboozled. I feel like, I feel like you made me, I thought, I thought I was the only special one in your life. And I realized. <laughs> yeah. So You've got all these other people. So you had a really interesting, yeah. like three different groups that kind of in your sphere of influence. And that's right. I think as we get older and we start thinking about, um, our leadership and we're organizing that, you know, in our mind about what leadership is, we start to reflect. And, um, so that's an interesting reflection that, um, you put together on how that all came about. So you went to the, um, you want, you wanted to go to the academy. Did you start there and then leave the academy and then go on? Yeah. Yes. This, yeah, the big holes because <laughs> it's kind of like the one thing, you know, and anybody that's listening, uh, when you're at 17, uh, at 17, I was a wild child. I was probably at my wildest at, at 17. And um, there's holes in my my childhood because I kind of I put them there. And the reason why is because at 17, I was going, I was junior year in high school, and I got into some trouble with the law. I was fighting. I was doing, uh, I was, I hate to always say it, but I was stealing stuff. Uh, and and it wasn't like I wouldn't just take a dollar off somebody. No, it was I was taking cars, tires off cars, and doing dumb stuff. I even my local little uh, town that I lived in, I had uh, the the police. They had a, a a police car up there, and I would yeah, I vandalized it and pushed it into the creek. I was a wild kid, and you know, and people didn't want to certain groups wouldn't want to do that, but then there would be two, two friends that wanted to do that with me. So we've always did that. Eventually that came around and caught up with me as my senior year. So I got kicked out of school in my senior year for 90 days. And, uh, at that moment, that's when I thought that I screwed up my entire life. I was in the, I was in the delayed entry program for the Navy. And I wanted to, uh, my plan was to go into the Navy and be a Navy SEAL uh, because I watched the movie with, you know, Charlie Sheen jumping out, out of the Jeep and over the bridge and jumped into the water. And I said, that would be me. Yeah. <laughs> I even created stuff on my farm. I created stuff on my farm. I had barbed wire over the Creek. So I, you know, I would, I would go out there and train in the Creek and I would go out to the local pond and a little, it was called a lake, but um, I go out to the local lake and my sister would have a little boat and she would, the engine on and I would swim as far as I could and hold on to the side and then swim again and hold on to the side. And I was so where I was very focused in one area, I was unfocused in the other. And so that, but the unfocused part is what kind of got me kicked out of the delayed intro program, kicked out of high school and thought my life was over. Um, and the reason I say that to you is because that was a big gap. It's a still a, a very it's, it's something that I tell kids, I, I'll be speaking in a local high school um, at the end of this week, the end of next week um, to the seniors and they chose me. Um, that's the irony of it. I've, I've spoken in all the high schools in the area uh, because the kids get to know me and I, I relate well to them. And uh, for me, it was a, those were dark moments when, when I, <coughs> sorry, when I was young. And so I kind of leave, leave that whole out because people look at you and say, yeah, now I'm 49 years old now. Uh, like really those experiences have helped me develop. And I know that we'll get to some of that um, today, but growing up as a kid, that Academy, the military, the, the law enforcement was kind of lost there for about a year and a half. And the reason why I was lost is because of my, gas to the fire right so um, how, how did you turn that around so you got yeah. that was your dark place and you're like i have really messed up 
And, um, and, and it's a great lesson for anybody that feels like, you know, I really made some bad decisions and, and we all do, you know, some worse than others, but tell us how you turned it around. Cause I'm thinking about general Franks in his book. He talks about, um, when he uh, was asked to leave the University of Texas, Austin, and uh, he said the army was hiring. And he said, besides that, I thought the thought of um, going into the army and being a soldier and doing all the things they do, just as you described as like Navy SEALs, he said, was just plain studly. And so I always thought that was pretty funny because it's, you know, it's a, a it's a, Something that young men grow up with, you know, I want to be cool. I want to be studly. So, you know, so here you are and, and now, um, you've made some bad choices. And so tell us how you turned it around. Yeah, it's great. Um, well, I tell you how I, I turned around and, it, and it had some to do with me and it had some to do with other people is, the one beautiful thing about my life is that everything has been planned out. Like something has planned out for me and, you know, not to make this, you know, podcast about anything other than leadership, but, but for me, there's always been a a higher power at, at work. Right. And I remember when I was set, I remember when I was sitting in the, 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 the MEP station and getting ready, you know, signing up for the Navy. I remember seeing the Marines over here and I remember looking at them and thinking, man, what am I doing the right thing? Because I was going off of a mood. I had no idea like any other kid. And, you know, to be completely transparent, I've talked to, I've talked to a hundred kids. It's come in here and sat in my office that I'm in right now. The one that I have a flag on just this wall, but everywhere else is all my, my military accomplishments. And I've had people want to be special operations and not one of them, not one of them have made it. I have one guy that's close. That's close to making it, but not one has actually done it because of what it, you know, people want to do lot. People want to be lions, but we don't want to do lion stuff. Right. Right. And, and so for me, I wanted to be a special operation, but I didn't really know. So when I'm sitting there at mess and the Marines are right there and I'm like, did I make a dis- bad decision? Well, what ended up happening is I get kicked out of that. There wasn't an option for me to go in any military branch. Like it was gone. It was pulled away from me uh, with me. And what happened is I went on a, a, I went on probation for a year, almost a year and a half. And then oh, what ended up happening, the really sh- the short version is, is that a Marine recruiter, a Marine recruiter by Gunny, named Gunny Norman, he was a force recon guy um, by trade. He was the last man to be pulled out of Vietnam as far as the, the Marines go. Uh, he was a recruiter in town. He called, he, my sister was dating a, a guy and he had gone and talked to the recruiter and the recruiter said, the Marine recruiter says, Hey, bring, bring Jamie in here. Maybe I can get him in. And uh, I told him, I said, you're not gonna be able to get me. in." he says, come in, take the physical fitness test. And let's see, let's take the ASVAB and let's see. Well, he already had my ASVAB score. So I go in, I take the physical fitness test. I was in pretty decent shape at that time. And three days later, I found myself at MAPS. How does that happen? <laughs> Gunny Norman, Gunny Norman was brave and bold and did some things, said some things and talked to a few people that got some things placed. And then he told me, he says, you're good. You have no waivers. You have nothing. You're good. And I said, okay, great. He goes, when you're in boot camp, don't say anything about your history. Nothing. Don't say anything. It doesn't exist. You're, you're, you're good. And that's easy for me. Like I, (laughs) that's easy for me. And that's what happened. I ended up going in the Marines, the Marines got me in three days, three days later, I was down at MEPS and then I was shipped um, away at a boot camp for 12 weeks. And during that moment of truth, they asked me, have you ever done this, this and this, or have you ever done anything? And no. Um, So I had no waivers. I went in and, and that's what it was. And then I got in and I felt I was a, I was happy, but I think in our lives, we get complacent sometimes, you know, and I was kind of complacent in there, uh, once I was in and, and then, uh, then it, what happened is I had the option to, to try out for a special unit. Um, I, I turned my, I turned into a physical fitness guy, uh, from a guy that didn't really exercise a whole lot to a guy that became 
I, that's that that became my life once I got in. It really really changed my life. But I, the reason I say that I was complacent is because I was around all my I was around all my Marine buddies in there initially in my first unit, and uh, things were just kind of they would they would it was a regular job to them. You know, we'd go in at seven thirty in the morning. We'd get off at four thirty, and we would have an hour and a half for lunch. And it wasn't what I thought it was, right? Everybody thinks of you know certain things, and for me, I wanted it. But it was my first exposure one to to true, you know, like what leadership looked like. It was the start of it, and then it was a start of something for me. But I didn't join to get off at four thirty. I, I joined jump out of planes and shoot guns from a long distance and dive and do everything that I thought that the movies were. And I was fat when I got in, it wasn't quite that way initially, initially. And then it turned into that, which I, you know, hopefully we, we, we I get to say something about that. Oh but, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, it was the, was that special operations then that yeah, opportunity initially yeah initially it was uh i went in as an open contract um the marines they they wanted to get me in fast you know and gunny norman had got me in so i went in an open contract which means they were going to stick me with whatever mos or job that they could give me it turned out to be okay it turned out to be decent i ended up being a communications guy um uh, a communications guy uh communicator is what it was this is a 2531 is what the designator was back then. It's an 0621 now. And I went in as a communicator and I was around, I was in a motor T unit, which means I was in a motor transport unit initially uh, for my first year. Once I got there though, I just, uh, the exercising and the, I was, that's all I did. I would, I would get up in the morning. I would swim in the morning at the pool. If I wasn't exercising, they call it PT, phys physical training. If I didn't PT with the unit, then I would PT myself. I would go in and I would swim in the mornings and then I would run at lunch and then I would lift weights at night. So I was doing, you know, three days. I remember prior ever going in <laughs> and I remember thinking to run five miles, like no way would I ever be able to run five miles. No way would I ever be able to run 10 miles. You know, now in my life, I've run, you know, three 50 mile ultra marathons. So, um, when I look at, when I got in, I just became, because I saw what I saw in the military. And this is something I think that I have compared to a lot of people is I really see the positive in everything. I don't see negative in, in very little. And I think that helped me because I could, you know, for anybody listening, like you could stand on your head for four years, <laughs> right? right? You literally could stand on your head for four years. And for me, I wanted the Marine Corps to be a stepping stone for my future of what it was. And I, cause I had thought I screwed it up and I came up with a perspective. I came up with a saying for myself back then, you know, is that any situation is from an individual perspective. You can change any situation that you're in. If you could just take a dip, just take a one degree shift and change your perspective. You can change any situation that you're in. And for me, that's kind of what I did. Once I got in, I'm like, I, I have to make this work. I have to, I have to make this success when I have to use it as a stepping stone. Not because my life was messed up over here, but, but just because I'm, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to give four years of my life, away and now I'm I'm a year older than everybody else then I have to make this the best four years of my life and what ended up happening is in that four years like that physical fitness took me to another level it allowed me to get promoted and everything because you have to do five things in the military and and you do those five things you'll get promoted <laughs> you know especially as and those those are just basics basic stuff you know, to get busy, not, if you're not busy, get busy, do your professional military education, which is, they give it to you, tell you to do it, right? Stand up, right. pray, rest, tell people, right. sir, ma'am, you know, the commonalities, stay in good shape and keep your hair cut. <laughs> That's, it was really that simple. And yeah. for me, um, once I got there, once I, once I did that inside the Marines, I was able to assess for a special unit. And that unit was called uh, first force reconnaissance company. And I assessed a, a year, about a year, a uh, couple months after I was in, I assessed for them and, and was selected for them. So your gas to fire personality, or that's who you were served you well. 
in the military, especially special operations, because when you're in, you're all in and um, you had plenty of focus and uh, determination. So I think it's interesting. It seems like all of us um, have somebody in their life that was a mentor that made a big difference. And so your Marine Corps guy was the one that really made a huge difference and opened the doors for you to use all the positive and good for something really special. And I think that's really great. And I think it's important for all teachers, and I know they know this, and professors to see what a huge difference they can make in the lives of um In the lives of people, I've heard it over and over again in our podcasts, how one person really made a difference and set them on a path of success that they were truly amazing. So so now you're in the Marine Corps and you're in special ops. Do you want to share anything about that, how that developed your leadership? You know, there's a lot of teamwork in special ops, so um, I don't know if you want to... Talk about how important the teamwork was in addition to your individual preparation and determination. So, yeah, thanks. Um, you know, once I, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of crazy because I, I listened to, I listened to David Goggins, uh, you know, I, I read David Goggins book one time and, and he's talking about, his struggles into certain things. And I know David Goggins on, you know, talking on a podcast, but um, all of his struggles were the same as, as what mine were the little differences. And once I got in, like I never prepared for the, I never prepared for the, the assessment to force recon. I never prepared for it. I just was in great shape. And, I, I went over and I, I passed it. And the irony of it is I went over on a Wednesday and the, 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 the indoc is what they call it. The indoctrination was a physical fitness test. That was a full day long. It was on Thursday. And they just, I walked in, into the gate. I was intimidated. I was a young, um, at that time I was 20 years old. I think I was 20, uh, young, a young Marine walking through these gates that looked for me, they were just something much bigger than me. Um, the, the understanding when I was in the Marines, I was not expecting the Marine Corps. Like I, I was expecting to be able to go out to a rifle range and shoot on a rifle range and I get tons of ammo and I get to shoot a gun. And that's not how it is. Like in the, in the big Marine Corps, like you get, you get your ammo and it's handed to you and you hold it and then you don't load a magazine until they tell you to load a magazine and you don't shoot around until you, and it's very like it's very strict. Now you shoot a lot of weapons, but for the basic most part, like you're on a rifle range and it's a known distance range and you got to. So I wasn't expecting that. When I go to the bathroom, I have to hand off my ammo and have to hand off my, you know, hold my weapon. And, and it has to be that way. I didn't know that though. So the reason I said it is because when I took that indoctrination to go to force recon, that indoctrination included a three mile run pull-ups, push-ups, and sit-ups. And then you had to get a certain score on that. And then you moved on to a pool workout. Pool workout was 500-yard swim, 500-yard swim in full camis, no no boots. And then you had you had a certain time you had to get on that. Then you had a 15-minute, they don't tell you how long, but it's 15 minutes. It was a 15-minute water um, confidence piece. They would jump you into the water, swim to the other side, you do exercise and you do that for 15 minutes. Then you had to do a rifle retrieval from a, from a pool. You went down to the bottom of a 12 foot pool, grabbed a rifle, brought it above your head, tread water for, for one minute with a rifle above your head. Then you would place that down and then you would go out. We ran over to the obstacle course and did the Marine Corps obstacle course three separate times. Two, the first two times are timed. I know that now. I didn't know that at the time. I thought all three were timed. You had to get a certain time limit. Then you did 10 exercises each, each in two minutes in duration. You had 10 separate exercises, each for two minutes in duration, and you had to get a certain number of each one. Then you ran right from there. You ran over to the back over to where you started. You donned a 50 pound uh, rucksack on your back, a 50 pound backpack that had a sandbag in the back of it. 
you tied it, 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 you know, you strapped it down and you went off into the hills of California. I was living in California at the time. You went off into the hills of California for an eight mile, what they called ruck, ruck, ruck march. It's basically a four mile an hour is what you needed to maintain. And you went up into the hills and you were, you couldn't fall more than uh, five meters behind the person in front of you. If you did, you were put into at 25 meters past, you would get put into the truck and your, your time was over. And then it went out to the beach and then you did a three mile run home and three times into the ocean. And then you took a psychological test and that was your physical fitness. And then you did, you sat down on an interview uh, with them. That's how you got in there. I had found out about that physical fit. I had found out about the indoctrination on Wednesday. I took it on Thursday. Wow. Um, so I had no to prep. I just, I, I, yeah, I realized at that moment, like for me, when I passed, there was three of us that passed. I'm still good friends with those, all those um, guys, a guy named Corey Nash and a guy named Mark Schmidt uh, went, went through that with them and passed that. And I spent the entire time with them. I was a young, I was a young guy at that time outside of the unit. And so they had to, they had to talk to my leadership over here to make sure that I would meet the requirements over here. And that I was mature enough to be over there. Um, and you know, they called me a fire and forget weapon when I was in, because I did those five things. Like I did those five things cause I never wanted to mess up. Uh, once I, once I got in, I realized, um, that this is my, my opportunity. And once I got there, so to go back to the rifle range, when you think about it, like go back to a rifle range, I was instantly brought in everything though. I've had to do everything has had to do with somebody taking chart, taking me, taking me, put me under their wing, the mentorship, which is one of the key points in leadership, right? Right. We have three, three roles of leaders. We have three roles as a leader, three roles that we fill. We, a command, a coach or train, and then a mentor. Those are the roles that we fill as a leader, right? That's not the standards of a leader, but those are the roles that we fill. Command, coach, and mentor. Command, train, and mentor. And I had a lot of mentorship. At my other unit that I went in, those guys brought me in and said, because I was doing those five things, like people took me under. So my my first real true leader in the Marine Corps was a guy named Sergeant Converse. It turned out to be Sergeant Major Converse, and now he's out, retired. But Sergeant Converse took me under his wing and he gave me guidance. It was true. Like, this is what mentorship looked like. This is what it means to be a Marine. This is what it means to be a man. And then I get to force recon and, oh, it, the, the, the skies opened up. It was truly the grass is greener. I don't really believe typically that the grass is greener. There's certain situations that it is. But when I got to force recon, like everything that I thought that the Marine Corps was going to be, everything that I thought that I wanted to be, the, the guy, you know, the kid is sitting in school and says he wants to go do that. That's what I am. I joke around with the kids here when they try to act too cool. I said, don't try to act cool for me. Yet. I'm the one that's jumped out of a planet 25,000 feet, not you. So get over here, shake my hand, and let's let's talk about what it means to be you, right? So because that's what I was doing. I was doing the commercials. Like I, I'm a walking commercial when I got in there. And so my first exposure there um, is I go to a platoon. I was in a platoon called fifth platoon and I went to platoon and they take us to the range and literally they said, here's your ammo. <laughs> here's the ammo. There's your left lateral limit. There's your right lateral limit. Those are all targets engage as you want. These Orange tip ones, these these rounds are made for shooting down range. You put those in the end of your magazine to know that you're almost out. You'll see a red tracer. I never knew anything about that. And I went out and I shot thousands of rounds that day. And then we blew, we got to blow up in this, this tree. We got to blow half of it. It's called an abatis shot. I was able to put C4 explosive on this tree and blow half of it and leave some of it left so that you can't cut it down easy. It makes it, they explain all that to me first exposure to that. And then I was, I got another a team leader, which his name was Joe Morrison, still a mentor in my life that took me under his wing. And he taught me the first thing about leadership, right? It's not, it's not practice that makes perfect. It's perfect practice that makes perfect. And he sat me down and he mentored me and he guided me in my life. He's so much of a leader, so much of a mentor to me that I sent my son out there at, at, uh, 15 and a half years old to California to live with him for 10 days 
And uh, he's still a, a positive uh, power, a power force in my life. So when I got there, I realized what a force recon platoon, platoon could do because you were truly one team with one heartbeat. Like you have individual personalities here that have quirks and, but man, you were on this unified team. And I talk about this. I talked about it when I retired, when I retired from the Marines, I, I talk about a moment that I realized I had finally made it because when you go there, you end up going to jump school, you, you go to jump school, dive school, um, free fall school. You go to reconnaissance course with, those are 10 and eight weeks long. And then you go to a thing called Sears school. And then you're trained up to go on a platoon. Your ultimate goal is to deploy two separate times. This is before the war had ever kicked off. You go two deployments and then you would rotate out and then rotate back in. I had gotten into that platoon and I had gotten my schools all done up. And I remember my first platoon operation, first true understanding of like seeing teamwork at its finest. We were on a submarine. We were going to be on the submarine for three days. For me, I'm the, I'm the kid in the candy. I'm still like this, even at my age. I've just slowed down a little bit. But I always wanted to do everything. So I get on the submarine. We're in there. We've got a platoon of force recon guys. You're looking at about 20, 24 guys, roughly. And on the sub, we're, we're sleeping back with the torpedoes. And I get to dive the sub. We get to do all this stuff. But what we're going to do is we're going to do an amphibious operation, from the sub, the sub's going to come up to surface. We're going to launch our boats from the top of this sub. We haven't got quite permission. This is what we want to do, but the captain of the boat doesn't want to do it. He's not quite sure that we could be on surface that long with the sea state and all this stuff. And I remember big John Croft, big daddy Croft, uh, the second guy in my life that really tried to change my life. Met him. He was my assistant team leader. Um, he's very successful out here in the civilian world. He's very successful in the Marine Corps. Um, just a true mentor and, and leader, uh, every definition of the word, big job, big daddy. Uh, I remember him going into a brief and he powered down the captain of the uh, captain of a submarine. The captain is a Colonel or full bird of a submarine. And he tells him this is, we can do it. A force re he goes, a force recon platoon can do it. So my second piece of leadership was confidence, Right. Right. confidence just have confidence you know because you can influence people if you have confidence in what you believe right and who you're with he goes in and he powers down this sub and he goes we can do this we need to be on surface we need to be on surface for six minutes that's what he said once we get the boats out of the six minutes and what he meant is that what he was saying is that we could blow up we could inflate some rubber boats Zodiacs, they're called F five seventies back then. They were CRSCs, combat readiness uh, raid craft, and we would we would inflate these boats to a to a certain standard. We would put aluminum decking in them, put runners down it, tie down the trans, and put a fifty five horsepower engine on them. And then we would put uh, a compass on them, and then we would launch from the top of this submarine. I told this in my retirement because the reason why is is this is when I realized. I had made it to go back to where I was in high school, thought I screwed up, thought my life was over. And now here I am on top of a submarine. And I remember the sub, we're pulling them out. We have six minutes. We have somebody that's keeping time and we have six minutes to get these boats out and inflated on top of the submarine. We have one air hose, the rest are foot pumps. And we're, we're inflating these boats. And I remember the guys counting down and we're inflating these boats. And we're getting the, on them. And in the 30 seconds, he shuts the thing. And the, the sub is not stopped in the water, but it's still moving in a knot, nautical mile an hour across the water. We're out in the Pacific Ocean. There's no land anywhere near us. I remember telling this speech in my retirement. And the reason why I told it is because this is a key point for me in the, in the military. When I was there on top of this sub, and we're putting these boats these engines on these boats and he goes 30 seconds and the, and the, the sub is still moving. And all of a sudden the sub starts to go underwater, starts to pick up speed. The waves are hitting a little bit harder. Our boats, we're all on our boats. Now we all have the bow facing forward and we're in a line. And then all of a sudden the sub dives under the engines start and we go into a, a V formation. The submarine disappears. And now we're in a V formation with our, five boats that we had out there at the time. We have five boats and we're in a V formation. We have a navigator that has his compass on and all the rest are following him. We're on communication 
And my only job at that moment is just to be on the right side or the starboard side of the boat and let the engine guy know if I see kelp, if I see kelp so that we don't get it caught up in the engine. I just raise my hand. The guy on the side of me, he's doing the same thing. And I remember the reason why I tell this story and the reason why it's so powerful to me is because as I'm telling this, as I'm on this boat, the sun is shining down on my back. It's a beautiful day. I have my booty. I'm the commercial. And I'm in the Pacific Ocean, the dark body of water, deep, and the water splashing on my face. And I, I, we just, we just did something that people would think were as impossible. People listen that would listen to this right now would think there's no way they got that done in six minutes. We got it done in six minutes. One team with one heartbeat, inflating these boats because of leadership, because of the confidence. And now here we are in the middle of the ocean. There's no land anywhere near us. We're headed towards one point that's already been pre-plotted. We had three days to plot our route out. And now we're on this boat. And I, my only job is just to tell kelp. And the sun's shining down on me. The waves are splashing in my face. And I remember seeing flying fish jumping in front of my little boat. And I've never seen a flying fish ever in my life at that moment. And I realized that these are this, this is a real thing, that really such thing as flying fish. And I remember, I cannot believe I get paid to do this. I get paid to do this. Like all this and a paycheck too. But there's always a but to this story. And the reason why I say this and the reason why I told this in my retirement is because I believe in leadership. Some key points. (laughs) The most powerful word in the dictionary to me is perspective. Is perspective. And for me, as I'm on that boat and I'm, I'm hugged up the gunnel to all this in a paycheck to, I have finally made it. I, I'm at my pinnacle right now. I'm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Nothing could bother me. I look to my left and the guy that's in the same exact position as me, just on the port side of the boat or the left side of the boat. You know what he's, you know what he's doing? He doesn't do the same as I do. He's complaining about the waves. He's complaining about the weather. He's complaining about how far we are. He's complaining about the water. He's complaining about the engine smell. He's complaining about the gas. It's a little bit of gas that's in the boat. He's, he can't see the good in any of this. And I remember the reason I tell this is because for, for me, anybody listen to this podcast, anybody, what is leadership, right? It's the power to, it's the power to see the positive in everything, to see the potential in whatever it is out there. And for me, as I was on that boat, I realized there's always going to be this guy. There, this guy is always going to be there. I'm never going to be him. I'm never going to be him. There's going to be moments in my life I'm going to feel like it. There's going to be moments that I'm down, but I have finally made it, and I'm on this boat. I'm 20 At this time, I'm t- probably 22 years old, probably 21, 22 years old. And just a couple of years ago, just prior to this, I thought I screwed up my whole entire life, but because, because I never, ever saw the cliff as an option. It was never, the the jump off the cliff is never an option. There's always an option. My perspective can always shift. I can always look at that. That goes back to my parents, right? Having good parents, having good people around me, having the mentors in my life, having the Gunny Normans, the, the Sergeant Converses, the, the Big Daddy Croft, the, the Joe Morrisons, you know, having the force recon between this one team with one common goal, one united front in front of me, nothing could stop us. And I realized at that moment, it was, it was the best thing I ever did. Like, it was the single best thing I ever did to make it to that, to make the decision to move on to that. I think it's really important to note how unbelievably important it is that the confidence of the leader resonates through the entire team. And yes. And as you said, you know, it's all about perspective. You're always going to have that one person or, you know, maybe, maybe, but if if you're lucky, you don't, I, I appreciate how you put it into perspective. And I think that's so important and I'm listening to your story and I'm thinking about general Franks, if you don't mind, um, General Frank's four core principles of leadership are caring, communication, common vision, and character. And so here you've got some guys with some tremendous character, especially your mentors, and they cared about you. You guys that took a tremendous communication to get all that done in six minutes, but you had a common vision. 
This is our goal. This is what we're going to do. And I mean, it was short term. Sometimes there's long term common vision, but I mean, this was a short term. It was six minutes. So I think it's, it's a great, great story in how you put that all together and your perspective. I thank you for sharing that. So, yeah, of course. So in, in the military, um, you accomplished 22 years in special ops. Um, you went through skydiving, scuba diving, reconnaissance school, ranger school, and, uh, marine scout sniper school. So it was just, was it just one after the other that you accomplished while you were there? Yes. You know, I think what, again, perspective, right? And, you know, when you look at, um, when you look at perspective for me, those schools, I didn't, going back to looking at high school, you have regrets, right? You have, when you look back on your life as, as teenagers, you don't, you didn't, you didn't play enough sports. You didn't give enough commitment. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. Every time that an opportunity arose, like Marines don't go to ranger school, not typically, but I chose to. And the reason I chose, so those schools, when they, when the opportunity arose and those schools, those schools would come up, I never turned anything down. I never turned anything down because I didn't want to be able to sit on a podcast and tell you, man, I have a lot of regret in my life. No, I can tell you, I have no regret, none, none. (laughs) I have no regret in anything that I've done. Every decision was calculated, but there are some decisions that I could have made differently that would have taken me here. Yes. But for me, I didn't want to have regret looking back and I wanted to be able to say, you know what? I wanted to be a line and I wanted to do the line stuff. And when I sit on the front porch at the end of the day, it's going to be my experiences though. So to those, to the, to those those schools, because there's so many more that, that I had gone to um, while I was in, the thing that I wanted to make sure that I did is that when the opportunity presented itself and the, the common focus wasn't always me either. Uh, so when you talk about common vision or when, when, when General Franks talks about common vision, like those schools sound like there are a lot of individual for me. No, no. I was just, I was the, I was the recipient, but see, we needed a sniper. So, Hey, who wants to go to sniper school? Cause the platoon needs a sniper. I will Hey, who wants to go to jump master school. We need it. We need a jump master. I'll go. Who wants to go? Who wants to be, you need to have, you need to be on the free fall committee you, or you need to be on the free fall team, Jamie, you know, can, will you go to free fall school? Sure. Yeah, I'll go. We need to go to ranger school. No one wants to go to ranger school. We get nothing for it in the rings. Nothing, not a single thing. You know what I what I get? I get to test my I get to test my leadership skills in the most austere conditions possible. I mean, it's the it is the premier leadership school, and I, this is a Marine saying. Let's pause for just a moment while we hear from one of our great sponsors. Hello, this is Jay Zacharias with the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum, and I would like to tell you about one of our partner sponsors. His name is Justin Krieger, and he has worked as an independent insurance agent at Krieger Insurance Agency in his hometown of Hobart, Oklahoma, since 1999. Justin is honored to help with the annual Celebration of Freedom event and has been a board member for the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum for many years. He is also a fifth generation farmer and rancher in Kiowa County, where cattle, crops, and even insurance is sold with a handshake. Give him a call at 580-726-3076 or come by the office if you would like to speak with Justin Krieger or Kathy Lankford about insurance. We are thankful to our customers and friends who have supported us through the years. Again, Justin would like to say how honored he is to live in such a great country and how proud he is to help sponsor these podcasts. Please enjoy the rest of this podcast experience from your friends at Krieger Insurance Agency. Yeah, you had asked me about my schools and did they come in sequence? And uh, so you have a a general group of schools that you do 
soon as you get to, as soon as you make it into force, Re- you know, as soon as I made it into force recon, which was your jump schools, your dive school, um, you, you go to your basic reconnaissance course first, and then you go to jump school, then dive school. Um, and then they try to get you to sear, which is a survive of aid resist escape school. Um, but, my other schools kind of came along my career, you know, as I went to it. One of the things that I was saying earlier is that I, I've gone to a lot of schools and it sounds like a lot of the schools were for me, but in reality, a lot of the things that I did was because I, they had a need in the platoon for somebody to go here. And if the opportunity presented itself for me, I didn't want to be the guy with regret. Uh, too many times I had regret from high school, not doing this and not doing that, not giving my best effort or not being the best person that I could. And as I looked in my life, my, when I look, reflect back on my childhood, I have a lot of regret from, from my being a kid. I, not, I always wanted to, I wanted to be a better wrestler. I would have liked to have gotten truly into wrestling and, and taken it to committed to as well with wrestling as what I did in my military career, but I didn't. You know, and I didn't play football because I moved from the the city school to the country school. And, you know, and I had this this animosity and I, I was still close enough to the city school that I kept all those friends there. But the country school couldn't quite I couldn't quite, you know, morph into that group. Um, and so when I got into the military and the schools, opportunities presented themselves, I went to it. So when the platoon needed a jump master, I volunteered when a platoon needed a. A, you know, you know, they call free fall jump master, which is you, you pull your own parachute. That's the difference between static line. I went to it. You know, when when the ranger school slot though opened up, no one wanted it. And what happened is the guy that had taken it said, "Yeah, I want to go." And then right before it was time to go, he he you know, see, you know, somehow hurts his back. You know, so I just took the school and. A lot of guys will say, I didn't learn anything from Ranger School. When someone, somebody tells them they went to Ranger School and they didn't learn anything, well, then they lost the, the whole concept of it. Because for me, out of all the schools that I went to, Le- Ranger School was my most profound one for me. And the reason why is because Le- Ranger School is true leadership. It's leadership at its, I mean, and the, uh, you know, uh, in other books I've seen them, they talk about it because Ranger School is true austere conditions and you're leading and training people, helping people. And they're your peers. You have no, nothing on your collar. There's nothing getting them to do what you want them to do other than your influence, right? That with them. And for me, and I get nothing for it in the Marine, nothing in the army. Oh, it rockets your career, but, or it, it tears down your career depending on what your job is. But for me in the Marines, I get nothing for it. Nothing, not a single thing. Not a promotion point. Not I don't even get to wear a tab on my uniform. But for me, the thing that I learned there is like in the times when we were the most stressed, or or because we were either start, you know, we felt like we were starving. Even though you're given plenty of food, you're tired, you're hungry. There was one day, there was one point in one of my five day patrols that we got forty five minutes of sleep. Like I had a full on conversation with a tree in Ranger School. But to be able to lead a patrol from point A to point B and to be able to, to accomplish the mission and take care of your people, right, to, to be able to do that in those kind of conditions and to have them want to do it, that's what I learned there. And I excelled at, at Ranger School. But it, it was great. I, I tell people, like, I would have got the leadership award. I got, no, I got number two. What's that mean? <laughs> nothing. It means nothing. Anybody that was listening to this and heard this, they'd say, that, that guy's lying. No, I was in a hospital room. That's why I, I got I received a nice scar out of Ranger School. And on the very last patrol, when I could, when I could show them, I would have let my hand fall off. Just so you know, I would have let it fall off. I was not going to recycle Ranger School. <laughs> it just wasn't. It wasn't in my mentality to recycle. And I let this hand swell up. I hid from them. Um, I don't. Uh, for for my sake, I almost died uh, because I got cellulitis that turned into staff, got into my joint, went down my arm. I would have let this hand fall off because I wasn't going to. Re- but the reason I say I, I took seconds because that's what the guy kept told me in my hospital room. He came up, he flipped me a coin. He says, hey, you would have you would have taken the leadership award, but we can't present it to you because we don't know if you're going to make graduation. You graduate, you're going to graduate, but 
We don't know if you're going to make graduation because you're still in this hospital room. I say that because Ranger School was my premiere for me because I had led those guys. Those guys wanted to do everything for me. I kept the highest peers in, in, inside the course when I was there. It was a great school. I don't uh, – so all those schools I did for me selfishly, but every one of those schools was presented to me because of an opportunity for the platoon. So they self-serving, I went to them so that I didn't have regret at the end of my life, right? But they served the platoon. So I did it selfishly for me, right? But unselfishly, I did it for the platoon. And it was all all overall for the for the mission of of the platoon and, and who I served. But being able to do that also allowed me opportunities because Inside of the Marine Corps, I was I was assessed for later on outside of Force Recon. I was assessed for an, another unit, which was called Debt One, which were a small group of guys that were selected for. And I was a proof of concept, which stood for a bigger unit. And I was fortunate to be on that because of the opportunities that I put myself in with those schools and and <laughs> people thought that. People thought that I was just doing it for the platoon, but for me, I didn't want to be the guy sitting on the front porch saying, you know, I was a line, but I didn't do line stuff, right? And right. so from my perspective, right. was to take every opportunity to do it. Servant leadership. 100%. Because I, I know that you wanted to have something to offer the team. You didn't want to be that guy that... um held the team back. You wanted to be able to offer something to your team. And so you're out there getting all the experience and knowledge that you can. In turn, your team is trusting you because they know that you have this knowledge and experience. And it's not just about offering it to the team. It's it's servant leadership because you're giving of yourself to your team and to your people. Yeah. You also won the Bronze Star. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it, I uh, thank you for saying that about the the one in leadership. Um, yeah, it, it's the one thing I would I would have loved to have gotten. Uh, just mm-hmm. to say I got it, I got a little coin for it. But um, as far as the Bronze Star, I did some I did some uh, stuff in Africa. I was uh, deployed with a unit. Uh, in Africa, it was a joint unit that I uh, was fortunate to serve with, and I did some stuff in in Africa that, uh, yeah, that, that turned out to do um, a pretty profound moment for me. That I was able to to save a few people and help out some people uh, at a moment that they needed to be helped on, um, and uh, it, it it earned me the bronze star. I'd love to be expound on exactly what it was that that I did. Um, but I, 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 I always, I'm that person always says, I never tell somebody that you, you, you can't say certain things. And I just, you know, there were some things that I did that were and where we were at and what we were doing. It just helped with that opportunity. So, um, but, but it, it's not, so my, my V or my uh, bronze star doesn't have a V on it. So it's not because I had rushed a machine gun nest but because I was doing something inside of a a country that we were working um, in clandestine operations, um, covert operations. And I was able to be at a critical point and a critical moment to, to help out a group of uh, guys in a certain situation and save a couple lives. So it was all those experiences that you had stepped up and volunteered for rolled into one. And, you know, I can, I can, see that. And I know you guys don't like to talk about medals and awards so much. And, you know, and I, and I think that's, um, shows some great humility. So you, you've gone through all of this, you've done five deployments and now you've, you are currently working for in leadership for a company called the program Mm -hmm. and you work with team building and leadership development. Tell us from the military to now how that kind of all transpired yeah so i was uh uh, my platoon commander in 99 so my platoon commander force recon which would have been my second deployment uh he had he and i had undergone some you know not only you know 
when you start talking about leadership, you know, there comes a thing called trust, right? And trust is built oh. through. Yeah. So when you start talking about leadership, right, like that's one of the key points in having uh, leadership, right, is, is trust. It's a characteristic of, of uh, leadership. And trust is built three ways through shared experience, you know, consistent behavior and transparency. Well, with that shared experience, 1999, Eric Capitulic was my platoon commander. Uh, Eric Capitulic is one heck of a man, uh, another key figure in my life that's still in my life currently. Um, and uh, he he and I shared an experience, not just with the platoon, but in 1999, there was a helicopter crash that he was on and six of my teammates were, were killed in a helicopter crash for in training purposes. Later on, we ended up deploying. I actually have seven deployments, but five are in, the, in combat. Um, and we deployed into combat or not. We didn't deploy into combat, but we actually deployed at that time, even after the helicopter crash happened. And Eric Cavatulic eventually would leave that platoon at Force Recon and he would get out. And, and he started up a, a company called after a few years spent in um, other things, he started up a company called the program and our shared experience from 1999 all the way through, you know, the helicopter crash, the platoon, the bonding of, of that piece, you know, he, uh, he wanted to reconnect. He came to in North Carolina and says, Hey, Jamie, I'm, I started a company. I want you to be part of it. And he says, we're going to be working with NC state football. You want to come down and get to see me. I'll give you a little bit of money, you know, not much. And, you know, you can help out with this team. I said, what do I have to do? And he says, just be yourself. He goes, it's leadership and team building through shared adversity. And, and I said, okay, I'll show up. What would you like me to wear? He told me what to bring. And I, I showed up and that's kind of how it started. Um, and that was in 2000, uh, I can't remember what year it was, but uh, 2008 or nine, something like, something like that. And uh, I showed up and I, uh, I met with NC State football and we, we did an event. And I remember sitting in front of college coaches for the first time going over what we were going to be talking about. And I talked about leadership and task conditions and standards. And uh, we started talking about decentralized command and, and these kind of things. And, and all of a sudden coaches are taking notes and I'm like, Maybe I know a little bit more than I ever thought, because I think we all have learned this in our lives is that humans have 60,000 thoughts and 80% of those thoughts are negative. <laughs> uh, wow. 95% of 95% of those thoughts are stuck on loop mode. You know, the people listening to this podcast right now are telling themselves like, ah, I could never do that, or I can never do this, you know, and then all of a sudden it gets in this repeat mode and you start actually becoming your thoughts, your thoughts become your feelings and your feelings manifest themselves into action of who you become. Right. And when we get caught in that thought and I remember telling him like, what do you want me to do? Like, he was just be yourself, like, just be yourself. And I, that was really, truly my guidance. And saying we went over little things, you know, hey, we're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about, you know, mission accomplishment, take care of your people. And this means taking care of people means making every decision with your team's best. Oh, well, yeah, I've heard that. I know that. What's it mean to be a great teammate? What's it mean to be a great teammate on this team? We're in different teams. Set the example, not lead by example, set the example which means meet or exceed the standards of your organization, right? Meet or exceed the standards of your organization, and then number two, hold people accountable to it. Jamie, that's what I need you to do. Okay, that's easy. Do that. And so showed up there, and it was 2008, and we've been working with them ever since. And and now we, you know, we work with 160, co you know, collegiate athletes and corporations around the country. And we've done that. You know, we've worked with some of the. I work with Tennessee football and NC State football currently right now. And uh, you know, so and we work with a lot of big the big uh, football teams and, you know, my current teams right now are for softball right now because they're, you know, I work with, uh, I work with Tennessee softball, I work with Florida state softball. They're going in as one and three into the regionals on Friday. So, um, and I just work with Tampa women's lacrosse who just, you know, went all the way and Tampa men's lacrosse won the national championship last year. So, um, and what we do is we talk about, we talk about leadership, but, 
anybody can talk about leadership, right? It's easy for us to talk about leadership right here, right now. This is why Ranger School is so powerful to me. But when it's 70 degrees and sunny, it's easy to talk about leadership. You right. sit, you and I sit down at, if you and I sit down at lunch, we can talk about leadership and anybody in the room is going to have ideas of what leadership is. And when you tell somebody, yep, yep, that's what it is. That's what, yeah, you're right. You know, they're going to say kids these days, the, the high schoolers listen to this. I met some high schools yesterday and, and inside a tractor supply. We have this little place called tractor. Supply. I was buying 12 chicken, 12 more chickens. Cause we have, 25 chickens here at the house, you know, and uh, I was buying some more chickens and uh, I ran into these high school kids. One was my, my little uh, cousin. And then he, his little, his, his buddies were standing next to him and he came up and Hey, Jamie shakes my hand. It's good seeing their, their, you know, their seniors this year. And we start talking and I'll tell anybody this thing. People talk about kids these days. It's not kids these days. (laughs) It's not the kids. These days are just as tough as kids 10 years ago. You know, 20 years ago, the problem is us parents, it's us parents because we want, I just had my buddy, my buddy just had a kid and he says, yeah, he's like, yeah, my, uh, my wife's already talking about homeschooling. She's already talking about homeschooling. She's, she's talking about this and that, and that, and this and that. We want to make our life. We want to make our kids' lives easier than what ours was. And I always tell people like, I'm pretty proud of my life. I'm pretty proud of my life. If I wouldn't have had these experiences that I had, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. That no, your life is is a bunch of experiences, a bunch of adversity, and that you're formed. That's what forms you, the adversity that you have, the exposure that you have. You remove, I saw I saw this quote one time, it says fear. Fear doesn't prevent, doesn't save lives. It prevents us from having a life. Like, cause we, we, we step back and we, and so for me, when I was talking to those kids yesterday, I go and Hey man, you guys look like you're fit. You know, I'm complimenting them. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I got to get driven. You got to get focused. Hey, remember this. And then we start talking and I go, how old are you? And they're 18. I knew, I knew Marines in the, I knew, I knew young Marines, 19. They gave their life for this country. <laughs> They gave their life for this country. <laughs> they were hard as nails. When push when push came to shove, they were hard as nails. And they saved they saved people's lives. They're just as hard. We just don't, don't we don't allow them or we don't push them in the direction. We don't want them to to experience this or that. And so for me, that's what the program's teaching. We're changing youth at one, you know, one team at a time. In corporations. We go in and we talk about leadership and what it is and what it isn't. And what leadership is, it's influence, uncoerced influence. And you get it two ways, by the person you are or the title that you hold. But you have to have a willingness, desire to be. You know, it's kind of like General Franks that it says it's developed, right? You have to have a willingness and desire to lead, though, right? Just because you have influence, yeah, by, by definition, you're a leader, but we see it when it goes left and right, right? It, we, we have to develop it. You know, and just because you have a title on you doesn't make you a leader. You have the willingness and the learn, desireness to want to want to lead and want to be in this. And I remember I was talking about this just yesterday is that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I sometimes, you know, I'm a, I'm just a normal human. I have those same thoughts in my head, the 60,000 thoughts. And some of a lot of them are negative. Sometimes they get on loop mode. Do I need to go do this? Do I need to go do that? Am I happy? But man, the opportunity to sit down with you, to, to talk to, to talk to those, you know, whoever's listening, right. To, to see those kids in tractor supply and take five minutes to get to know all three of them and what they're going to do. And just to shake their hand, look them in the eye, one to make me shake their hand, make them shake my hand, right? Look them in the eye and compliment them on what they're going to do and where they're going to go. And let them know that there's going to be some, there's going to be some rough patches in your rough road because no longer are your parents there to soften it. You've got to, you're going to have to face some, you're going to face some, some punches and bruises. Man, that, that we, we all do. That's what makes us who we are. And that's why we are where we are at. Go ahead. Absolutely. And I leadership 
to me is so much solving problems, getting through something and getting to the other side and not just throwing up your hands and quitting and, you know, complaining about the situation. It's just putting your mind to it and getting to the other side and being better yeah. for the experience. And I think that is just so much of it. Let me ask you along the way, you, you've covered so many of the important things that that I wanted to ask you just on your own. And I think it's awesome. Along the way, you met and married your beautiful wife, Angie, and you've been married for 29 years. That's that's pretty amazing in the fact that I'm sure that a lot of this, you were in the military. Is that correct? Yeah, just about all of it. All of yeah. about a year. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm going to say she's pretty tough, too, because she she hung in there um, with all of your experiences and and was supportive. And you have two sons, Colton and Caleb, 17 and 15. And one of the yeah. questions we ask is, what would you tell your 17-year-old self? And I think you've covered that. What do you tell Colton and Caleb? <laughs> uh Colton is uh Colton is my handful. He is the gas to the fire, just like I was. It's why I make my so I question my parents and how they were able to keep me on track. Colton is my biggest leadership challenge, right? And uh, you know, he just went through some trials and tribulations the other day and um, you know, with, with school, uh, social media is a, a real thing. So kids do have that to contend with. It would be very tough to be a kid nowadays and, and with the social media aspect of it. You know, I won't complain about it. Uh, I just know that it's it's a it's a true thing. You know, but my son faced a thing with social media. Uh, uh, broke up with a girl guy. Uh, you know, she spread some stuff that went on social media. That went to this guy ex boyfriend. Starts spreading stuff about my son. Ultimately, my son grabs a kid, and beats him up. That's ultimately what happens. What do you do in that situation? You know, how do you handle that? You know, the, the principal says, well, he could have come to me. Well, then he's, then he's, you know, labeled a, a narc or a tag, you know, somebody tells him something, you know, then he punches the kid. He's wrong for that. He's suspended. What do I tell my 17 year old when he does that? I go, number one, I'll, I'll always, I always will support you for standing up for yourself. I will always do that. Here's what I'm going to tell you though, is that with what, they said and how they say it the the biggest thing is is that you have to remember that you look at somebody in the eye and you tell them when they when they say things about you you can look right at them and say before you write that on social media before you do that you look them in the eye you tell me if you're you're being a coward you let them know that you're serious about that right um for me though i told i told colton right a couple of things, a couple of life lessons that I give to, to myself. Number one, the thing that I've realized in my life and why I'm, I've always been in what I call, um, didn't realize I was in it would be the good old boy network. I've always found myself in the good old boy network. I don't know how I ever get there. Uh, I don't know. I don't realize it's the good old boy network when I'm there is, you know, why I've realized this is that be careful whose toes you step on today for they may be linked to the ones that that you may have to kiss tomorrow. Uh, I read a book, a very powerful book when I was a young kid or not young. When I was young in my life, it was called how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie. It's a, it's been a bestseller since I think 1968 or something like that. It's an old, old book. Uh, it's all the techniques still apply to this day. It changed my life when I read it. And because at the end of the day, how did I find myself have three groups of friends when I was in high school? How was my life in the, the, the military the same exact way when I reflect on it? And how is my life kind of that way now is it's not what you say. It's not what you do. It's how you make people feel at the end of the conversation. At the end of the conversation, if they feel like it was genuine, that it was a genuine conversation, then <laughs> they will remember you. They will remember you. I sat down at a sake place last uh, on Mother's Day with my with my sister and my mom. My mom, my sister had drove up, driven up here. I had given a speech at a school, a high school, um, for Veterans Day just a few, uh, you know, l last year. 
I sat down at this sake place. It's where they, they do the egg and they, they cook and hibachi and they do the whole show. I'm sitting down with my mom, my sister, and there's a little girl sitting beside me and her dad sitting next to her. Her dad looks like he was in the military at one time where I'm talking with my mom and the little girl and the dad, we end up communicating and conversating with them. As I'm sitting there, the the little girl says that she went to this high school and it's the high school that I spoke at. She goes, I, I go, I gave a speech up there uh, last year. She goes, she goes, I thought that that was you. And she looks at me. She goes, she says to me, she says, you changed a lot of kids in our high school, the way that they are with the, the pledge of allegiance, and the flag. Now they, you changed a lot of people. And she looked at her dad and she says, dad, his speech was amazing. This is what she says to me. I don't know her from anybody. It's a chance encounter just on Saturday. And she says to me, and she says, and I said, really? And she goes, yeah. She goes, I remember everything you said about it. And she goes, and now when I sing the national anthem, I think about it. And she goes, and I know what a rampart is now because you said it. And I started, and she goes, and it reminded me of my dad because my dad was in the military. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to her up because her dad hadn't said anything about being in the military because he was medically retired. He looks like a, he looks like he's pretty capable. He, but you know, he's a legit guy because he doesn't start bragging about what he did in the military. He just, you know, he looked at her and he hugged her. And for me, for me, the reason I say that is because what would I tell my 17 year old self? Remember, it's not what you say. It's not what you do. It's how you make people feel. And surround yourself. This is what I tell my 17-year-old self. You surround yourself with people you want to be like. Not be, you don't want to compare because comparison is the thief to joy. But the people that you want to emulate, the people that are going to help you get to the next level. Because we tend to surround ourselves with our level and lower because it makes us feel better. Surround yourself with, show me your five friends, I'll show you your future. And I, I realize that now because the key, couple of the key people in my life to this day are still in my life. The kids that I hung out with over here in that one group, he's one of my staples in my life. The one reason I became as successful as I did and what I did and who's to measure what success is. For me, I consider myself successful. I may not be, may not be the richest guy in the room. I can always be that guy. I can always become the richest guy in the room. That guy can never be, do what I've done. That guy can never be who I've become. Never, never. And for me, the one thing that's been solid in my life is I found a great, <laughs> I found a great woman. I have a great wife. She never, ever, ever held me back. She never said, no, I, I, I can't do it. We can't do that because you're going to be gone this much. No, it just, she just, oh, uh, I think, thank you for sharing that. And I know, I know yeah. it's extremely heartfelt Sorry. and no, yes. it's all Sorry. good. It's all good. And cause it's just another testimony of how you put in a, a hundred and 50%, not a hundred, not a hundred and ten. You know, it's like your, your whole being is part of this and part of your, um, successful leadership story. And we appreciate so much you, um, sharing how young people can prepare for success. And that's part of it is going in with it with your whole heart and knowing you're going to get to the other side, um, that you're not going to quit. And I, I just think that's a huge part of it. Is there anything else that you want to say about preparing for success for young people or for our adult listeners about getting to the other side on a problem or, um, you know, never say never. I'll, I'll... I'll leave you with a couple of things and, and, and thank you. This is what I would say is that if you go back to what I said with those thousand thoughts, those thoughts in our head and negative 
2% of what we worry about never comes true. <laughs> Only really 8% of what we worry about ever comes true. So I don't worry about, I call them thousand meter targets. I worry about, you know, the 50 meter targets at in, and I really concentrate on the five meter targets. How do I get myself out of the negative thoughts? I've been asked this a lot of, a lot of times people ask me to help them with mental coaching. And I'm like, <laughs> you just do it. Well, that's not true. My pastor said to me once, he says, anxiety is not the situation that you're in. It's the thought of the situation that you're in. Anxiety is not the situation that you're in, but the thought of your situation you're in. You can replace anxiety with any word you want. Overwhelm, busy. You're never as busy as you think you are. You're never as busy, really as busy as you are, as you think you are, really. And you could change anything. How do you change it? Have preloaded messages inside of your head. <laughs> have preloaded messages inside your head. <laughs> I will. I, no one can make me feel inter- inferior without my permission. That's a thought inside of my head. <laughs> 92% of what I worry about is never going to come true. That's a preloaded message. Embrace the suck. That's a preloaded message, right? Th- this is going to. This is happening for me, not to me. Am I being a victim or am I being a hero? Am I being a Am I, who am I being? These are preloaded thoughts in my message. So whatever point I get into, you can look them up on the internet. You could get as many words of affirmation as you want, phrases of affirmation. I tell you to memorize 10. Put the 10 most inside of your head. They're preloaded because anybody listening to this message, anybody listening here has bad days. How do you get out of a bad day? By understanding it's not the perception of the bad day. It's not really a bad day. You're making five minutes be a bad day and develop some kind of support system. If you don't have good family, I'm fortunate to have a freaking wonderful family from my wife to my kids to my mom and dad. I'm fortunate to have that. Have a good support system. Find a good, solid friend. Get a good, solid friend that's there for you. Have faith. Have faith in whatever you believe. For me, I'm Christ- I'm a Christian. Have a good, solid faith foundation. Whatever your foundation is, for me, it is, it is our Heavenly Father. But it may not be for you, but to have a good, solid foundation, because that's the one person you can always count on and never let yourself down. Don't justify your actions. If you know you're doing wrong, don't look yourself in the mirror and say, yep, you're doing right. Look yourself in the mirror and know that you're doing wrong. I tell myself the other day, I was like, you have to get back into the gym. You have to stop letting this, these injuries be your excuse. And since then, it's gotten me off the couch. It's got me back in it, and I'm back at it and attacking it. Three workouts I did yesterday just to get myself to make sure. I'm doing a 3,000 push-up, 3,000 squat this month. I'm swimming twice a week. I do that because it makes me healthier. It makes me that. I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a better leader. Those are really my final thoughts to you. And don't let anybody ever make you feel inferior without your permission. When you feel inferior, you're giving them permission to do that. Those would be my final thoughts for the day. I want to thank you for just allowing me to be on here. Again, in my head, I'm not worthy to be on here. Um, but I must be, I must have made an impression on you somehow uh to be able to be asked to be here. I want to thank you for the time. I'm I'm humbled to be here. I'm really and thank you for just you know giving me the time and the opportunity to answer. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I you have no idea how much I appreciate the great words that you have offered our young leaders and it was it was such a great experience to meet you at Big Country Veterans which I want to say is an outstanding program in my eyes and I'm going to guess that you feel the same about your experience there. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. They're good, good people. Amazing. Good people that want to do good things that are great servant leaders. And so it's a great experience. But thank you, Jamie. I appreciate you so much. And um, it's a great interview. And it, and I can't wait to share it with everyone. This will yeah. uh, release in June, which is the month of Father's Day. And so awesome. I think it's, it's a great time to um, especially share what an influence your father was in your life. And uh, so thank you. Thank you. Happy early Father's Day. (laughs) Thank you. Happy Mother's Day to you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you again to REI Oklahoma for making this podcast possible. 
For nearly 40 years, the board, staff, patrons, and supporters of the nonprofit economic development, REI Oklahoma, are committed to expanding Oklahoma's economic prosperity, earning the reputation of being one of the most comprehensive economic development organizations in the country. Business loans, training workshops, business consulting, and networking opportunities, as well as technical assistance and even commercial business space, are made available to Oklahoma entrepreneurs and small businesses. For low- and moderate-income individuals and families, down payment and or closing cost assistance is offered. Learn more at reiok.org. This has been the Four Star Leadership Podcast. Now it's your turn, Four Star listeners. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and let us know what you thought of this episode. Be sure to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and tune in next month for our next episode that airs every last Friday each month. Go be great. The Labar family is a fourth-generation Oklahoma family. That may not sound like a long time, but our grandfathers were born here, within the Comanche Nation, before the land runs. We are the proudest sponsor of the Tommy Franks Four Star Leadership Podcast. We hope listeners will heed the words of these distinguished men and women who have served our country at the highest levels and across all walks of life.